Welcome to Two Month Review, the weekly podcast brought to you by Open Letter and 3%, in which we take a big book and talk about it every week, say some things. Sometimes we're funny, sometimes we're not. Sometimes we make sense, sometimes we do not. The books yeah. are always big. <laughs> the conversation is always fluid. But there are drinks and there's conversations. So what more do you what more could you ask for? Drinks and conversation. I'm double fisting it tonight. It's been a week. But uh, I'm Jeff Ghost from Open Letter Books, joined as always by Brian Wood, author of Joy Time Killbox. And this season, our 13th season, is kind of wrapping up. This is our penultimate episode um, for Ada or Ardor by Vladimir Nabokov, in which we'll finish talking about the book itself. And then next week, we'll read a few critical essays about it, of which I'll post them with this, with the ones that we're going to talk about with this particular um podcast so that people want to want to follow along can follow along but so how was your thanksgiving man oh it was nice i mean it was just the three of us so yeah. I, I ate half a pie today like why not <laughs> i did my usual thing and made slow cooker uh peanut thai chicken and like pad thai <laughs> yeah that sounds that sounds just about as american as anything else might as well it's a, mel a melting pot of fun stuff right very true. Very true. Yeah. What else has been going on? Anything interesting? No, not really. Uh, we bought a Christmas tree for the first time in forever, and I think it cost more than my first car. Jesus so, Christ. Christmas trees are expensive. I don't, yeah, I don't do that. Yeah. I, I don't believe well, in celebrating, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think the problem is like um, my daughter's at the age where she's like super into it, and so. I figured since we're all going to die in the next year, I should just let her have a Christmas. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you have to get the whole Santa thing going too. Yeah. Before, you know, for all COVID or a mushroom cloud, either one that's coming for us. <laughs> it's been a, it's been a hell of a week. So we delayed this a bit because a number of things have happened. And since this is like the only podcast we have at the moment, um, we should probably talk about some of them. Sure. I mean, huh. One well, I'm talk about our thing second, but one big thing is that it looks like Penguin Random House is buying Simon and Schuster. So oh, there goes publishing. <laughs> I saw that. So I, I I heard they were talking about it being the big. It's the big five, right? Yeah. Not anymore. <laughs> no, this is number one and number three merging. Yeah. I have to write about this for somewhere. I'm not going to say where because there's a fairly fairly hefty possibility that I write whatever I'm going to write and it gets killed. But, um, but I've been asked to write about it from like a few different perspectives as like for the writer or for like international literature. And there's literally nothing about it that seems positive to me. Yeah. I remember, um, my wife sent me an article about, uh, the woman who took over at Penguin and how she like really like turned it around, but had the curve and like it was it was an interesting article, but I was terrified at just how I don't know to me it felt like entirely predatory. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's like consuming and it's like a it's like it's like Galact it's like Galactus like maybe like not a bad guy necessarily, but just devouring everything in its path for it to survive. <laughs> All <laughs> It kind of felt like that a little bit. Every single one of these mergers is always because, like, all these big media companies own these these book properties, these book book publishers, and are always like, these suck. They don't make any money, and they're annoying, and they're not fun. So let's sell them. Like Disney sold Hyperion. No, I feel like they did, but like, but Viacom selling Simon Schuster makes sense. Like, no, they don't want them. And so for for Bertelsmann to just keep gathering them up. It's all about like finding a way to make just a little bit more profit. And that's generally about like cutting costs. And I have a feeling that like making it less competitive, writers will end up with less, fewer bids for their books and lower a bids for their books. See, I don't, I don't know anything about publishing. That's like your, that's totally your lane. But I don't know, when I, when I think of, it was Simon and Schuster, right? Yeah. I think of like the back catalog and then incendiary nonfiction. I think I think of Simon and Schuster and I think, wow, they're boring. <laughs> to be honest, that's a, literally like, my first thought. <laughs> so, like uh, the, the Great Gatsby and a book that talks about Trump being an asshole. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or the right. doesn't Simon and Schuster also have the right wing side of things? I I don't really I don't know. I feel like they were gonna publish the um oh who's that guy, the Breitbart guy? 
Oh God. Okay. <laughs> Milo. Milo. Yeah. Milo. The Venus. Um, Theoropolis Acropolis. Whatever his name is. Milo the fascist. Milo the fascist. The fascist with sunglasses. Oh my God. And like Ken doll hair. Yeah. No oh, shit. Girl. And then so, the same day, we announced the merger of a uh, eventual merger of Delkey and Deep Vellum. Wow, what's that all about? <laughs> that's a that's such the most earnest segue prompt that I've ever heard. So no, the, because um, like Delkey does some translation stuff, but like that's not really their thing, right? Oh, but it has been for a long yeah. time. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a very significant portion of like the new oh. book. Not all the books, but yeah, it's it's a mixture of everything dedicated to like innovative, experimental, strange books that wouldn't otherwise make in the marketplace. So that can include a lot of translations. But um, What's the purpose of the two is it kind of like banding two ships together to like float stronger, that sort of thing, or yeah, it's uh, there's a lot of stuff. Yeah, about. yeah. <laughs> let's just, let's just let's, I didn't say sinking ships. I said, I said band together to float stronger. That's a great way. Let's, let's thread this needle in a way that I won't be able to do after I finish these drinks. So <laughs> I'd been talking to John for a while about the ways in which Delkey could continue after he passed away because he had left every campus. They had no employees. It was a very dire situation. He couldn't get books printed. He couldn't follow through on obligations. It's very rough, right? And so about a year and a half ago, I started talking about what we could do to make sure it survived. And the what ended up, we can skip through all like the nonsense parts of it. But what ended up is that the best way to do it is that he's his big concern was being able to maintain like the editorial vision, the backlist title stay in print, all of that. Yeah. I'm going to oversee that for for Delkey's future for now, as a consultant or as something. So then. Um, the financial part of it, of how to make that happen and how to satisfy like any debts that Delkey owed, anything that was owed to John, things that were like messy. Cause it's like a 44, uh, it was founded in 1981. Um, I don't know how many years that is now. 39 shit. The press was done it in 1984, but the review of contemporary fiction that came out of it was 1981. So it's been almost 40 full years of like, you know, contracts and payments and all sorts of stuff. And for the last few years, there's been no one there to help him. So the information and everything is like jammed into one dude's mind and or computer. Yeah. So Will Evans from Deep Vellum, whose interest, he, he had never met John until recently, but his interest in the press was as being like the, uh, like he came here to, to open letter and was like a fellow a, a apprentice for a summer to learn how to start deep vellum and to be able to do publishing. And he's acquired some other presses along the way that don't do only translations, but that allow him to be able to be a functioning nonprofit publisher. And he's very interested in the business side and figuring this all out. So the best way that we could figure out how to make it work was to have deep vellum be the third party that would be able to assess all the financial side of things, the business side of things, and be able to have money to rehab Delkey. So th that is going to be the way to get this fixed. And I'm going to say something that will be said on this podcast. It'll probably be repeated elsewhere, but it's sort of privileged information, um, but not super. Delkey's monthly sales, net sales without a single employee are higher than Open Letter and Delkey are, and Deep Vellum combined. Wow. So, so, yeah. So we're trying to fix everything. I've spent a lot of time over the past week um, since uh, and the main part of this is that John signed this arrangement and then literally died the next day. Like literally. He had been waiting clearly to like find a way where he felt at ease with the future of the press and his legacy, and that he was then ready to let go. And it happened within like 30 hours. Jeez. So very sorry to it's a lot of emotions, man. Very you sorry to hear that. I mean, I know that's somebody you worked for for a long time. You've had ups and downs and ups and downs. Um, complicated guy, yeah. very complicated guy. So everyone's working through various things as to like the yeah. bad parts of it, like the the sort of mental abuse parts of working with John versus like the good things that he did for literature versus like the good things that can be done now. And like his dream towards the end of what 
he was like Charles Xavier of like, we could live in a world with like great, with like where mutants and, and readers can come together of all sorts and sizes. And you're, and you're Magneto. And I'm, like, I was Magneto, but now I'm Magneto's on the X-Men side, man. Current continuity yeah. all works. So, it's um, complicated. <laughs> sometimes so, we're in space. Sometimes it's House of M. I don't know what the timeline is or what's going on. What oh, that's all been reset, man. That's all been reset. So <laughs> actually, is that actually know more about that than I should. The uh, the the idea though that all that his goals weren't realizable in, in the structure that he had, and now they might be able to be realized. And Sorry. so it's like a real great opportunity. It's very exciting. Is very daunting. There are a lot of people that are emailing. I'm certain that people who hear this will email with information about the books that we're you're working on or supposed to come out with or whatever. Feel free. I'm piecing it all together. There is no single master file of what is under contract. Oh, I had. Uh, I actually had three books. I had Here, four G. Do it. Good. Done. No worries. I'm just <laughs> curious. And again, it's like so. <laughs> I'll tell one story because this will sort of emphasize it. So I have a spreadsheet of the publishing schedule from Delkey from John and none of the columns are lined up. It's not used like a spreadsheet is it's essentially like a notepad with like random dates and stuff in it. And so I've been going through that and piecing together like that with what has been formally announced. And then with all the files that I've gathered from all the sources, like I had a certain number of them because we were working together to try and make these books happen, but I don't have all of them. And like, it's not clear like what John might have had that we didn't have, like things like that. So I'm putting all together and I get an email from someone and they're like, oh, I have my first of the three Antonio Loba and Tunish books that I'm translating for Delkey is due on December 15th, but I need to ask for an extension, but that doesn't sound like a big deal right now. And I was like, wait a second. <laughs> I was like, first of all, that's one of my favorite authors. I signed him on when I was at Delkey and never got to work on any of the books. I was like, there are three of them? Those aren't listed anywhere. <laughs> Anywhere does that exist? And I was like, and you're supposed to turn one in in like two weeks? Like, two weeks from now? Awesome. It'd be good to know. I need I need a vacation to just edit and work and read and proof and figure out what the fuck everything is. But yeah, but that that is happening and it's very exciting. And I think it'll bol bolster everyone. Like Open Letter gets benefits of being able to have access to Del Archive authors and connections and deep film stuff. They get the the fact that they don't need that I have the background of having worked there for 10 years. They know like the backlist and what John's sort of mission was and how to acquire books. And now we can like essentially look at acquiring books broadly as like open letter, deep vellum and delky, which is a different sort of way of thinking about the future and being cooperative instead of competitive. So it's the anti merge, it's the anti PRH Simon and Schuster merger. It's the merger to figure out how to best do this thing that we want to do of finding unique and interesting literary works and supporting them and supporting the authors and supporting the, the artists, the translators and getting the books out there in a way that like involves our strengths on all three parts. Like Will's the best at like the business stuff and like making the, the hype and the deals. We can hire marketing people and have Anthony and Sarah helping together. I can do the, the editorial stuff with other people. We have a lot of like all of our strengths sort of get played to. So yeah, so it's sort of like the big, like, it, open letter's not officially, open letter won't change. It's not officially part of this in that way, except through my affiliation. Um, mm -hmm. But we will stand to benefit from it. And if you put the three together, we'd be one of the largest nonprofit publishers in the country. That's interesting. It's really cool. Um, just to illuminate my ignorance, how would you say each um, house distinguishes itself from the other? We've had to sort of come up with a new way of talking about that, and that's still in progress. But the main thing is Delkey, classic, out of print, Nobel Prize, heavy, important authors, open letter, and and then for the for the translations and for for uh, fiction written in English, more experimental, interesting, innovative, William Gass, those sort of like the the William Gaddis. Uh, the people that like they publish the David Foster Wallace school of things and the more more leaning in that way, which is fun because like I'll be able to see stuff now that I wasn't able to see for 12 years. Yeah. Um, and then Open Letter does young, undiscovered, new, up and coming translated authors. So we want to find that we want to find the hot next thing and like help build those careers. Some of those people will stay like with me. Not what's that? Like Rotorada. Hi. Yeah. Um, up and coming. Like, so I'm saying, like looking backwards, it doesn't make oh, as much sense as no, thinking forward. 
<laughs> but like we we would do yeah. so if if this were a perfect world, Rotorita would be a Delkey author and Sarah Mesa would be an open letter author. No, yeah, like with like like you know, like Sarah Mesa or with the Cars on Fire book. Yeah. Uh, like yeah, gotcha. And then Deep Vellum tends to be a little bit more social and uh countries that we that Delkey and Open Letter don't always hit, like the Indonesia, Malaysia, Mauritius, like those sort of areas of the world. Um uh, Deep Elm has already prided themselves on doing those sort of books. So continuing that makes a lot of sense. So there's a way that the three sort of work together, even if that's like a theoretical and never going to really look that way um, and could only possibly look that way going forward and definitely not looking back. It at least is some sort of a framework that the three are connected, but not, not the Venn diagram isn't a circle. And then do all three do poetry as well? Or is that going yeah, to be although, yeah, yeah. siloed? Wouldn't have to, but they all do. No, I like that. That makes like that that triangle makes sense where it's like like super serious, well established translations, uh, up and coming, and then stuff you might miss that's on the peripheral of, of translation that's doesn't have a voice or a place. Like I, I really like that. That makes a lot of sense to me. And like where we we just reprinted. I reprinted on Friday like a bunch of backlist titles that had fallen out of print for Delkey that we're just sitting there waiting to be reprinted. So there's a ton of like, there's so many good books in the backlist. It's incredible. So there are two things I want to say, and then we'll end with, we we'll, can end this part and move on to actually talking about the book. But one is that delkeyarchive.com, if you are listening to this, please do not order from that website. I have shut it down as much as possible and I put up a notice about it, but we don't know how to ship those books because the office where all the books were, books were were maybe are i don't know i haven't been there in literally 15 years um is in normal illinois the copies of the books that need to be mailed out to people who order them are maybe there but maybe not so we've been getting a lot of orders so i just shut it down and i'm going to try and figure out how to process those through like ingram but basically like go to the delkey archive press bookshop.org account and order your stuff through there that would help benefit Delkey if you want to help out Delkey Archives specifically. I know it's usually best, way better to like order from the website, but I just don't know how I'll be able to get you your books right now. So bear with me on that. The second thing is on, it looks like on December 9th, we'll have more details soon, there'll be a memorial gathering for John. If you want to attend it, that would be awesome. If you are someone who has a story or a, uh, an experience with John that you would like to share at such a public gathering, please email me. Um, I'm very easy to find. It's just chad period post at rochester.edu. But just email me because I need to put together a list of who wants to speak about John for this memorial ceremony. So do that. Those two things. Rest in peace. He was this, it was a complicated man, but like I have a, I have a really funny guy just out of nowhere. One of the forum employees sent me this message that John from John O'Brien to Jeff Waxman on May 25th, 2007. And she says, the subject is pet peeves. Jeff, I have a number of pet peeves. Let's see if you can figure out what is near or at the top of that list. John O'Brien. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of exactly it. All right. <laughs> so anyways, it's sad. It's but and it's been a it's been a long week of like working through various emotions and trying to figure out what's going on amid COVID, Thanksgiving, <laughs> personal catastrophes. Some fun, fun. Space, space and time. Space and time. So let's get into it. So what did you think of the end of Otter Arter? And be honest. Say your honest, say your honest truth. Um, one, I'm happy to be finished. Um, I'm ready to move on. <laughs> yep. Uh, I'm very glad I read the book. Um, I can't say it's my favorite um, or anywhere close to my favorite. Um, I think it's a uh, brilliant, uh, brilliant piece of literature for sure. Just maybe not my, like not for my palate perhaps. Um, I found the ending a little kind of like meh. What the fuck is this book for? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had a little... Just uh, I get the M E H period as the kids do these days. Meh <laughs> for the ending. Um, but damn, I love the last chapter. The last chapter was oh killer. Like Ooh, interesting. 
I dug that where he just tells you exactly what the book's going to be about. Oh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yep. And that, oh, by the way, they're like brother and sister, and it's hinted out in the very first couple pages. So you're I, more, yeah, you're more enough you don't get it. Like, thanks. <laughs> Appreciate it. But yeah, like the, the trip and balls thing about time and space and his, his theories on that and discoveries of it, taking pills, and then just like, now I'm old. And it kind of just has like this rosy, like kind of, um, like when you're watching a movie and it has that really nice soft lighting, it's really kind of like blurry around the edges and it's just gently goes off into the end. Like it, it kind of felt like that. Um, yeah. And so I, I, I was inebriated while I read this yesterday um, cause it was Thanksgiving and that's what you do. And I mean, granted like post Thanksgiving, I'm wearing a t-shirt and sweatpants and uh, you know, whatever. Uh, that's that's what we do these days. But the whole time I was thinking, I remember, I wish I could remember all of this, but I remember having a conversation when I went to Germany for the first time. It was the first time I ever went overseas. It was for like an editorial trip to Germany. And I went with like people like uh, Jill Schoolman from Archipelago, Declan Spring from New Directions, um, Blake Radcliffe, who had been working at other press. And we got into some heated discussion one night about like what the best thing would be for writing. Should it be for like sales, for the reader, or for making great art and this is clearly in the art camp like this isn't a reader friendly book it isn't a reader sustained book it also doesn't feel like a book that would ever be popular but the thing with the, the with what you're saying of like how it recounts that in the space and time tripping balls bit is that I, I the theory i came up with last night that i never fully developed was that this is only a book about time mm -hmm. there's only a book there's no space whatsoever and the fact that it takes so long to go through like their first summer together when they're so young and so long for like that next summer a few years later and then just jumps all those years and has like this little bit from when they're together and then a little bit and then at their their old age they they live together for like a fucking 50 years right like at the end like they after after vinelander dies they live together for 50 years married and like in this sort of happy state, just and, jumped about from a state to a state to a state. Um, yeah, working yeah. together, doing, putting their great works together, like whatever, right? Like none of those things matter. It's just yeah. the memory. It's just his his idea of time, time being like having no future, and all time being past recollections. The fact that it like is so big and then becomes so small makes me think this really is just a book about time and about and about the recapturing time. Yeah, I can see that. Um, and he, when he loops it back around at the end, it's like very um, Finnegan's Wakeish, where it's like the beginning will be this of my memoir about essentially time. Like it's a family chronicle, but it's a family chronicle of like two summers. It's interesting that we also had been talking about that idea of like heaven and hell and like the underworld, the over like the like regular world, and this idea of kind of like purgatory and like is what it. What is purgatory, but like some place out of time, right? Where you're waiting for judgment or something, right? Like, I mean, like what is what is purgatory? It is like without time, and yeah. It's kind of almost without place in a way, right? Like it's <laughs> it's devoid of place, isn't it? Yeah, right. in purgatory, like drifting through time forever. But in like it, we it's interesting we're talking about that like in previous you know felt like weeks months ago, but. Yeah, I mean, like, that's kind of what we have here, right? Where, like, it's, yeah. Which starts to maybe reframe ideas about, like, cinema and photography, that those are just forms of time, of representations of time. And it, it mentions it a lot. Obviously, there's a lot of talk about different concepts of time in here. And one of them is about pictures, um, uh, like a, a collage of pictures being time or trying to recapture time, for sure. Um, what was just a quick sidebar, like what, like some of my like overall thoughts of the book. Um, what was that, uh, blog you sent me where the, the, the two folks were complaining about, it was, um, Nickel Boys and another book. Um, and they're complaining like it was like YA fiction. Like these oh, are yeah. books. That was, uh, that was Jessica Crispin's. So there was, um, the, what the other book, it was Nickel Boys and it wasn't normal people. More people. They were like, basically, they were like, "What the shit is this? This is not. This is not literary fiction. This is like highbrow YA fiction. What are we stupid? Yep. Why does everything have to be so spelled out? 
Um, and it's something that I latched on to where I was um, watching this video essay on the death of melody. And how, how used to in music, you would, you would draft um, something melodic, like classical music, right? Where it has like melodic refrains and, and, and like modern music is about instant memory, easy to repeat, easy to hum and like club to. There's no melody. It's like a note pulsed over and over and over again. And like those, those new books that they're complaining about, it, it's almost as if those books are devoid of melody. Yeah. And, and this book is extremely melodious. Yeah. Um, and challenging and hard and difficult, but in modern, maybe with modern tastes, there's like this dying of, of melody and music and perhaps in literature as well, where it, everything is, is so cinematic realism, right? Something I know you complain about a lot. In there's a new Franz and Trilogy coming, man. Just oh, wait. I'm going to do it. Man. I'm going to take a <laughs> shit on it. Um, we'll, ha we'll do every episode with Ryan Chapman. Yeah. Is he a... Uh, is he he's a friends and head. He's a <laughs> cool. No, but like it, it made me think Hi, about Ryan. It, right? like, it just made me think about um, you know modern music being you know like you know Lady Gaga and Billie Eilish or whatever, where it's like pulsed out and like like super catchy and like fun, but you know it's you know it's not Debussy or like Chopin. Yeah. Or, you know what I mean, like. Is it so? So there's the music side of it. It's also like cultural, and there's like that weird. Um, to tie, I'm going to try and tie all this together really quick. Give me two seconds and see if I can do this. I've I've already had one drink, so we're doing well. One more. I have like hold, like put a pin on that because I, I so, this like musical uh, musical analogy I'm going with. Um, I've also been reading up on Thelonious Monk and uh, yeah. his famous quote um, is about like genius and what, what a, what a genius is. And his famous quote is a genius is the one most like himself. And I feel like out of everything I've read by Vladimir Nabokov, this is the most Vladimir Nabokov book probably like this is, and maybe that's why it comes maybe towards the end of his career where he's already rich. He's, he's done the Lita and Pell fire. He's like done well on that and he's good to go. And like, this is his, like a book just for him. Like this book pleasures him. Yeah. And it's solely for him. And it's fuck you to everybody else. Like this is my book, the way I want it to be. And I don't care if you don't like it. Like this is mine. Like that's so like, maybe this is his genius work. It's the most like him. This one is. Man, I've got so many responses to that. Remember okay. Gore Vidal. Cool. Go remember yeah. Gore Vidal. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. yeah. So part of the um, the part of that whole music thing too is like in a way you're you're com contrasting two different styles of music and like cultural is like emphasis on one versus the other has shifted over time. But there's the whole um, neurological basis for music appreciation, which is that if you can predict the next note, you get a boost of adrenaline when it matches. It creates a feedback loop so that like the more repetitive a song is within yeah. a certain time frame, it's much easier for you to like guess it. I get it. And remember and get it. Yeah. And whereas like the more Baroque, Rococo sort of like leanings of classical music generally, like both like what the classical musicians you're talking about, but even nowadays like Max Richter and Niels Fromm and like Nico Mooley and those people, those are in like, um, what's their name? Barwick, um, whatever. But like all the different people are doing it now, they do have like their melodies are extended. They're not repeated in the same way that that quick repetition is where you can remember it. So like it is, it is intentionally Baroque in the way that that is constructed, but we're not necessarily used to that. Like we're used to something else that is that quick hitting reaffirmation of like what you expected. And this is, I feel like this is his most, his most him book solely because he's just like, I'm just going to make my art. This is my orchestra. This is my symphony. Yeah, but no, like with melody, it'd be like the difference between like I'm not a good singer, but like when you wish upon a star, da, da, like there's there's several notes there, right, to make that melody versus pop 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 poker face pop pop poker face, like <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh yeah, I know. <laughs> right, and I, I think a lot of the stuff that's popular right now is more of like the poker face, more so than something that has a lot of notes in it. 
Yeah, I was listening to something the other night. I was trying to because I don't know music terms or like mm -hmm. sheet music or any of that. I never. My parents are too poor to get me an instrument in, in elementary school, so I never took instrument classes. But I really love music and have like a weird synesthesia with it at times of how it's constructed. That, I, but it's not based in like real information. But Kaya did study violin or, or played violin, and um, so I was asking her for this one song I was listening to where I was like, there's a background that changes too, too many times. And she was going through, we were trying to figure out that it was like a 16 sort of, it was like multiple beats. Like what you're talking about, instead of being like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. It was like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 30, 40, 50, 60. And then kept repeating like a 16 note cycle. And that those things stand out because they are weird because we're so trained for that like quick, normal down on the one and the three sort of like music beats and that this book is definitely not that it's not cinematic realism it's like essentially interrogating the idea of cinematic realism at the same time that's like putting forth like the emotionality of that like i didn't dislike the ending like you said you didn't weren't cool with it then it was pretty much i get that and at the same time i was like man being old in this situation doesn't seem bad like they seem happy they're horrible people but like i didn't expect anything good to come from this book and like there is a moment of like peace yeah and that's that's that was like not expected for me i think gore vidal so michael silverblatt from bookworm called me uh the other day uh to talk about john's passing and amid other things including like random insults about our book selection for Open Door. Um, we He talked about how he had been talking to Gore Vidal at some point in time and about Nabokov. And Gore Vidal was like, he's a bad English writer. He writes like a Russian who learned English. And that his, his prose is unique and special and its own thing, but his translations are not very good. That the translations that they did of his own stuff in English, from Russian and English, could be improved. And that even when you read things like Otter Arter, it's like, Nabokov writing. There's no, it's not like English. It's not American English. It's not right. like any of those things. It's that only that person could do that. Yeah, that's why, like, that when I read that Thelonious Monk quote, um, it really made me think of this book. Like, this just feels like extremely him. Yeah. And like, pure to itself, pure to his intent and mm -hmm. like idea. Yeah. Not like, uh, twisted by the marketplace or by expectation. Yeah. So what do you think of space and time? <laughs> Flat circle, man. Flat circle. No, I underlined quite a few different things. I mean, there's a lot to just, I'd have to read it. There's so many weird big words <laughs> in this ending part, done in a confusing manner um, that, yeah, I mean, I don't think that I necessarily get it. Uh, but I found it fascinating and enthralling at the same time. But. So I'm gonna put forth a hot take that hopefully someone that's watching will comment on or listening, is that essentially Vaughn is a hippie. Mm, okay. He's basically saying you can only live in the now. And that there is, it's almost like a philosophical justification for the rest of his life of being able to separate space and time so that time doesn't have, instead of three panels of past, present, and future, future doesn't exist. He eliminates that right away. Past and, can't and, and past is just the now that you remember, the now yeah. that you remember, and the slices of that. So he is like very much wanting to live in the now, which is sort of also the way in which you get around moral conundrums related to your sister. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, it's just yeah. a moment. It's just in the moment. I'm just living in the now, and is very. It's, he goes through such long, crazy things to try and make this make sense. Um, but he's just a hippie. He's just a hippie. Okay. Two fallacies. Two fallacies should be dealt with before we go any further. The first is the confusion of temporal elements with spatial ones. Space the imposter. Yada yada yada. Um, his trial will take place at the later stage of our. Oh, so there's that. And there's this line here, his trial um, will take place at a later stage of our investigation. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> huh. 
I, I, I kind of love Ooh, it. What he likes may maintain that space, with a capital S, by the way, that space is the outside of capital T time or the body of time or that space is suffused with time and vice versa or that in some peculiar way, space is merely the waste product of time. Yeah, yeah, that related, yeah, related to that one, I had the one that I flipped up into is on 544. The quote unquote passage of time is merely a figment of the mind with no objective counterpart, but with easy spatial analogies. And it is true, like we don't use, the time analogies that we use to describe the passage of time are spatial. So like a river, um, I don't know what else, but like passage, in fact, is a is seemingly spatial term. The past then is a constant accumulation of images, and that yeah. takes, which I, it makes me recall the pictures and when he was flopping down the pictures and it not necessarily matching up or questioning. Is that what it looked like? Is that where was this person to take this to take this photograph? Are they laying down prone, like by the? Yeah. <laughs> That's like yeah, the spatial nature of it versus yeah. like the memory of it. And yeah. that's the thing too that this book's really weird about is terms of like, he's writing that he's unreliable. He's written this, this family chronicle. That's just, it, it's really just a love story between him and his sister. Mm -hmm. um, the whole thing is designed to justify that, to justify the end of their, their, their 50 year, I don't know, blissful period, I guess. And in a way, isn't it his way of trying to contain and capture and hold on to perfection? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Realistic perfection too. Yeah. But like, and, and so then it becomes like these memories. That's all he's telling us is his memories the whole time. None of this is in the present moment. It's all like in the past. So he is giving us that sequence of, of events or memories or visions or images. And then you have those moments with like the pictures or the cinema, or like certain facts that come in. You know, the one that I'm most surprised by in this, um, this is a bit of a left turn, but like the thing I'm most surprised by is that the Terra anti Terra thing almost never comes up. I thought that was, I was like, maybe that was my, like, it could be subverting our expectations perhaps, but I was like, oh, we're gonna have something like a crazy person that's from here or there, or whatever, or what's gonna be the key, the primer, the nope, nope. You just treat it as like a real thing. Like it even says towards the end where it's like, they made that movie. This is this is also maybe one of those ironic twists. So in the last part, they make the movie of his book that he wrote for Ada. Yeah. And it becomes successful. And they're like, well, you know, it's kind of my book, but like, it's okay. It can't prove it. Well, it is. And it's, it's not like a shitty sci-fi film, right? Yeah. Like, they come out of their little space capsule and they're tiny and... And the thing is that they're tiny. Yeah, so like all the figures are tiny. Like yeah. all the figurines and like shit that they sell to yeah. go along with the book are like dinky little things. <laughs> it's like silly. But it's like it's like a then visual reimagining of something that he wrote for her early on under a pseudonym that didn't sell. Remember, it sold like six copies or whatever. And like, I don't there's yeah, there that movie image comes back yet again. Yeah. How about this on 552? Transmitted by the new, quote, Instantagram. That's why I named this episode. This episode is named Instantagram. <laughs> Only because I happened to flip over that page. It's like, holy shit. Oh, that's so close. Yeah, you were like, you're like one inch away from like being able to sue Facebook. Wow, you were so close. <laughs> Instantagram. Uh. <laughs> If only you weren't just some Russian person trying to write in English, you would have had that. You would have got it right. <laughs> you would have got it right, and like face, and Instagram would not exist, and the world would be a different place. Gore Vidal sounds like a hater. Gore Vidal does sound like a hater. Yeah. He definitely does. I did remember though when Michael Sorrell was talking to me that when I saw him at a a, a, a new Alipo conference in Los Angeles, like. 15 years ago, he told me that this was one of the greatest books ever written. It was Otter Arter. And I was like, well, I haven't read it. He's like, I don't even know. Like, you know, go fuck yourself. You don't count. You have to read. He didn't say it like that, but he was like, oh, you have to read it. This is the book. Well, have you read Gore Vidal's Lincoln? I know. <laughs> go leave. Get out of here. Get the fuck out. Get the, get the fuck out. <laughs> Just get the fuck out now.
He's the one that made Ben Hur awesome by adding all that homoerotic tension that Charlton Heston had no clue about. <laughs> Pack that I can smoke it. Yeah. Right on. You I could you not read, read this Buckley or whatever his name was after remember that used to be a world where like people would debate like like intellectuals would sit down and have a conversation about presidential debates. And can you imagine that? Nope. Yeah. Nope. Can't. Can't. <laughs> Would like to. Can't. <laughs> oh my God. But it is. Oh, one thing that's interesting. I forgot to look this up, but um, on page 542 when he's, so there were a couple things about his time thing that stood out to me. One was the, the hippie aspect of it. That's just basically about being in the now. Fair. Yeah. Got that. We've got all this like, this is a book of filled with like an unreliable narrator talking about time and memory, which is just like raises so many questions. And really the consciousness of it is the now that he's writing it and how he's writing it for this moment. Even the even so far as like Ada's punctuations in the beginning, remember she had all of her like uh, sides and in, in, um, parentheses. Those are like of the now as well. They're like her reading of the book and commenting on it in now time not about what happened, but what she's saying about it now. Yeah, like when they were talking about like, perhaps we shouldn't do this part with Violet Knox. Right. Lest she read it. Yeah. But yet this is typed. And so it's kind of like this weird kind of screws with your mind a little bit of like, wait a second, what's what the hell? Yep. How, what? Yeah. And so in in one of uh, Nabokov's like legitimately last books, um, the uh, shit, look at the Harlequins is a parody of his whole career and a parody of Nabokov himself. And in that, the character, the main character who is Nabokov and marries like 20 women and it's like the opposite of Nabokov and like in every way, but it's like a big joke and it's very funny to read. But he, um, the character can't imagine walking down a road and then turning around and walking back. And this is part of the ambidextrous universe that Martin Gardner wrote about of like the reversal of things and being able to go forward and backward in, in space and time. And I believe that he references Nabokov in that book. And then Nabokov references him in multiple books, including on 542, where John Shade, a modern poet, is quoted by invented philosopher Martin Gardner in the ambidextrous universe on page 165, is 165 quoting Nabokov in the real ambidextrous universe about the imaginary John Shade, who's littered throughout here. Who John Shade, for anyone who doesn't know, was the poet from uh, uh, Pellfire. Yeah. He's killed. Oh, spoiler alert. Also, related to Pellfire, I believe that on 545, where it talks about old Zembre, that's Zembla, the, the where, um, it's like, what's his fucking name? Oh my God, it's John Shade and, uh, Oh shit. Do you remember who the character from Pale Fire is? The one that does all the footnotes? Uh, gosh, it's frustrating. I haven't read it in forever. But either way. Can't think of it. But John Shade shows up a lot. Like she translates him. That's why, again, like I, I kind of took this as like this, like he's pleasuring himself with this book. Like this book is for him. Like Charles so Kinboat. Charles Kinboat. Kimbo, yeah, yeah, yeah uh, very much like a self-referential. Or Trout, I think, is the the, the person you're thinking of. Exactly, yeah. exactly. What are they, it's, what is it these male authors just wanted to like love themselves and <laughs> and create new characters to love them and put themselves in their work. So, so in love with themselves. Ironically, right before we we came on here, I finished reading uh, Times Arrow by Martin Amos, which is about a man's life told backwards. Mm -hmm. And it involves the same, and Vonnegut's reference, the idea of time is talked about. It's very much another time book. Oh, that was the other thing I was going to say. That the time stuff in here reminded me, like, as an echo, but it's been too many years, of the Quentin section in Sound of the Fury, where he's talking about time and eternity and kills himself. Uh, which, it, I don't think that they're, that's intentional, but this idea of, of like, um, of the process of sort of mediating on time is like an interesting one for characters to do because they're within us they're i mean you're within a weird trap space i don't know i'm gonna stop that thought that thought's a that thought's a crazy thought okay my purpose in writing 
uh, my texture of time, a difficult, delectable, and blessed work, a work which I am about to place on the drawing desk of the still absent reader, is to purify my own notion of time. I wish to examine the essence of time, not its lapse, for I do not believe that its essence can be reduced uh, can be reduced to its lapse. I wish to caress time. Yeah. Yep. And in some ways, I feel like this kind of echoes Nobukov in writing this book, where it's like it's a blessed work, and like again, like the like there's like not even a reader in mind for who it's who it's for. It's like solely for it's just solely for him. It's so, I think it feels like, although it's so like, brings a lot of pleasure to himself in writing it. Maybe the class hey, is wrong with that. Um, but again, it gives me this idea that this is like this feeling, this is like the most, one of his like most Nabokovian books, if that makes sense. Maybe the classical music thing makes sense too, as a, as a, as a framework in terms of like, that that's not immediately apparent. The structures aren't immediately apparent. The sort of motifs aren't immediately apparent. It's something that requires you to like give yourself to the art. The art brings you to it. Like you can understand it through going to the art instead of like the Jonathan Franzen sort of way of telling a story, which is like coming to manipulate you. Mm -hmm. Like I don't feel manipulated through this book. No. I feel the book is what it is and I can try and figure it out, but it's not going to be like, I'm going to manipulate you and make you feel shitty and weird. And in a way, that's a contrast with Anna Karenina, which is manipulative in a lot of ways, where it does like set up scenes that you have feelings about certain characters and then twist them over and over again. Yeah. I, I, in this book, I felt, I didn't feel like an invited guest. I felt more like a voyeur. Yeah. With this book. And like, I didn't know, I don't know the world. I'm not invited here. Um, and I'm 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 privy to see things and know things and know secrets or whatever, but yeah, like I don't get the jokes necessarily. I don't get the you know like I'm not I'm not part of this cast like yeah. this high cast system or whatever. Um, so yeah, I think it does have that very like for me it has this kind of like voyeuristic feel to it where like I'll let you into a slice of life that you know you're not necessarily. Holy shit, wait, I have a whole nother reading. Okay. Give me one second here. I know that I don't think that this is textually backed up, but let's believe this for one second. Or let me let me let me have this. Let me have my QAnon conspiracy here. <laughs> so one of the best parts of Lolita, the best part of Lolita to me is at the very end when he Humbert Humbert goes to find her years later. And she's like married and unhappy and living in like a trailer in like a trailer park and it's like all shitty and all like the glamorousness of what he described of this like how ugly she looks yeah because she's like 16. everything's like yeah her i don't armpit. think she's more than 16 but like <laughs> no like, it's just like her armpits are discolored yeah shaving them or like like little like these like oh like the the way he describes the details and like it's so disgusting this person's head and you're inside that yeah Go ahead. Sorry. What if all this stuff that were that? Uh, what if all the Terra anti Terra? What if all the the money, all the estates, all that stuff? What if that's all a lie? And really, these are two crazy incestuous people that are like old and corroded, letting forth their truth now. But they're like not in any of that special high pollutant world. They're just creating. He's creating that. This was our love story. It wasn't this like you know, manipulated terror. What, is this, what if this is like Fight Club? Sure. No, I, I do find it interesting, like in the, in the three works we've referenced from him, uh, Lolita, Palfire, and this, um, all are like terrible, unreliable people, right? Like this kind That's of like, name. really enjoys um, having that be his medium, but, um, and they're all different in different kinds of ways, right? I always thought it was like less re uh, less unreliable and more solipsistic that the world that they create through a book is uninhabitable. That that the artwork that's created by that character's mind doesn't mean that you have access to their mind because you will never have access to your their mind. What you have access to are the words that they've created and the way they've chosen to create them for you. So Kinboat like goes to a, like he might be the most um, 
outrageous in this way of creating an entirely different reading of a poem. Yeah. And it's like, I remember his was always like, I'm, I really know this poem. So you need to have me to get the, I am the, oh. I am the key to unlocking this for you. And it's so, more, yeah. So it's more that the poem, he believes that the poem, instead of like him being the key to unlocking it, that his history is what's being told. Like you can't understand it unless I'm here. Like it's the self-importance of the, of the critic almost. Right. Yeah. Versus the importance of the author itself. Although uh, well, with, with that one too, maybe then critic or like the biographical point, like yeah. what is this based on? And that's yeah. like always been like the Lolita problem is like readers that read Lolita and are like Nabokov wanted to fuck young girls. And like, and that's not it. Like, yeah. it's not that. Um, and even with it, with the pale fire it becomes very clear that he's like, I am the biographical information that he's then poet made into a poem. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And like my real life is what's been poeticized and transformed into this other thing, which isn't true. Like those links aren't there as you read it, but yet the character believes they're true. And in this, we have Vaughn believing all this is true and creating this like Edenic, his dad's so horrible. His dad is the devil. He was the son of the devil. What could he possibly do? There's like so many ways in which he's constructing a narrative that you can like inhabit that's visual and visceral and like dirty and weird, but like not just unreliable, like maybe just not even true. Yeah. And, and, and for me, like part of it, it makes me feel like text, like texture of time, Terra, anti-Terra is, is this a way for Vaughn to, to like, make amends for the love of his life and the passion of his life. That it's this awful, terrible sin and, and to make it okay or acceptable in some way. What if Vaughn's just to reconcile for, like to reconcile within himself that um, does it really matter? What if Vaughn's just schizophrenic? Yeah, there is no, there is no Terra and anti-Terra. They don't live on anti-Terra. He hasn't received information about Terra by talking to mad people about their dreams. Yeah. His time is his time that like never ends like that because he's in an asylum, not moving. I'm going to do way QAnon level shit here, <laughs> but like, like, I hope we can find the craziest read of this book and that that's it. Because like for me, like I, I don't find there's like for me nothing. Like not a single thing redeeming or good about Vaughn. Like probably from beginning to end of this book. Did you feel anything? There's a, the ending parts where they're like where they're together and they're old really hit for me. Really? I don't know, maybe I'm just like maybe it's like it was holiday. I'm sentimental. I'm an old man. Like sure. I'm just like this feels pleasant. Yeah. Like that's how if I knew that I would live to ninety seven and like. That would be, and there'd be like a love that you're with at that point. That's nice. Like, I get that. Like, that feels good. And that's sort of redeeming in the sense that, like, they made it. But no, other than that, no. That gets like, that balloon gets popped just a touch when um, Ada says, like, you sh you should have married Lucette. Like, we, we, we literally teased her to death. Like, yeah. She's dead because of us. Which, which to me kind of pops that that balloon like like maybe it's okay like maybe Vaughn thinks it's okay or good but I think for her there's so much anguish of what she did to her family by by pursuing by being like tempted by the devil basically right yeah right. that was my feel of it but maybe some scholarship will help us out we'll find out next week. I did love the last the last page. I thought it was just outrageous. The last, the last, yeah, last chapter with like explaining what's going to happen is so wonderful. Yeah. I I'll, like it's a spoiler. I don't care. I just want to read it out loud. It just sounds so good. It's it's worth it. Uh, page five eighty eight in this version. The rest of Van's story turns frankly and colorfully upon his long love affair with Ada. It is interrupted by her marriage to an Arizonian cattle breeder whose fabulous ancestors discovered our country. After her husband's death, our lovers are reunited. They spend their old age traveling together and dwelling in the various villas, one lovelier than another. 
that Vaughn has erected all over the Western Hemisphere. Not the least adornment of the chronicle is the delicacy of pictorial detail, a lattice gallery, a painted ceiling, a pretty plaything stranded among the forget-me-nots of a brook, butterflies and butterfly orchids in the margin of the romance, a misty view described from one marble step, a doe at gaze in the ancestral park, and much, much more. One of the, you know what stood out to me about that? Hmm. That, that section more than that, which I really loved and think is really beautiful, is that Van has a the one the various villas, one lovelier than another, that Van has erected all over the Western Hemisphere, but he never has. He's yeah. erecting them through words. He's huh. not erecting them as like actual locations. He doesn't believe in space. This yeah. is the only time he's creating this myth. Mm -hmm. Right on that same page, the part that I marked is like one of my favorite, favorite lines was nothing in world literature, save maybe Count Tolstoy's reminiscences, can buy in pure joyousness and Arcadian innocence with the artist part of the book. Which is a nice like self flex. <laughs> oh yeah. Not yet. And I like too, like we talks about a lattice gallery, a painted ceiling. And then earlier in this, we get the, his impossible remembrance of being seven months old and yeah. falling in on his crib, right? Yeah. Like the world falling in on him <laughs> and surviving yeah. somehow. So yeah, I mean this, yeah, man, he's a hell of a writer. It's, I think that there's a lot here that would like, it's very easy to read and be like, I'm not sure what I'm getting. And which I like, I feel like I'm joking, but like kind of only of like, what is this for? Like if, if I assign this to my students, they would never read it. They'd be like, not to, not to dismiss my students, but like the average reader would be like, this is no fucking plot here. There's yeah. no fucking thing. Like where's the action? Where's Jason Bourne? Where's the murder and the resolve? Where's the twist? Sure. And it, there's not like, what is the climax? The climax is him being like, Time is weird. Like if that's really the thesis of this, that's funny. But like, it really, but I feel like people that have gone through this have pulled out these things, and that there is like a second level to it. And the way that like the first time you read Lolita, I'm not sure. Maybe maybe it was I didn't read it in a class. I just read it on my own for fun over like a Christmas break. That and Pale Fire, and I read both of them. Was like, what the fuck am I reading? Like, what the fuck is this? And like, I needed to go find, like I need to reread again or find someone to explain to me like what the intricacies were. Cause I knew, like, I mean, there's some point where reading Pale Fire is like, I think this guy might be crazy. <laughs> and like, that's like, that's like as close as it gets. Like when people get into like Stanley Kubrick, like you watch, you can watch Eyes Wide Shut nine times and have nine different Girls ideas of what the movie's actually about. Girls Club. <laughs> yeah. I want to get in that girls club. I want to get in that girls club. Fidelio? <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what I mean? Like it's 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 layered and textured in such a way where you could have nine people have nine different interpretations of what it is, and they might all be right. Yeah. That's very um, Lynchian too. Correct. Like there, there's a density and a weirdness to it, but masterfully, masterfully done. Um, and I, I would Definitely say that of this work for sure. So I don't have any other favorite. That was my favorite line. Do you have a different favorite line that you want? Otherwise I have like a final comment on that. No, I, I read enough. I'm not, I don't like hearing myself read. So I've done enough reading for this, yeah. for this episode. Like with the David Lynch thing, it's like, it's a, it's meant to provoke and be strange, mm -hmm. but with intent. Like, I, I don't know that they, I don't think that I, Nabokov less so. Okay, this is what I was gonna say. Lynch is on one end of the spectrum, Kubrick as well, but Lynch is on the end of the spectrum where he puts things together and it's like, these images, sounds, sayings are like haunting, weird, pointing at something, but I don't think he has an explanation for them. And Nabokov, I think, actually does. Except for maybe Dune, but that's a whole other... <laughs> I haven't really watched that in a million years. I watched that when I was like a child. Dude, it's weird. I rewatched it, like getting ready for the new Dune that's coming out. Oh my goodness, <laughs> it's a weird movie. <laughs> Made a shitload of money. Oh, it's bad. It's not. It's weird. You know what movie you need to watch is the Alphabet Killers. Everyone listening, to this go watch the Alphabet Killer. It's filmed in Rochester. You will see the darkest, most depressing version of Rochester possible. I fucking love it. I could see though with this book, um, like 
reading it again and reading it a third time and then just like nerding out to this thing. Yeah. And reading it 10, 12 times and like it being one of your favorite books of all time. I totally get that. Um, but I don't know if I'm going to be that person or not. Yeah, I don't think I am either. But yet at the same time, I do want to read the, the criticism and get to know what other people like really love about it. Because I liked it. It's like a seven and a half for me. Well, for me, it's just like I there's so much of it that I didn't catch. There's no way I could appreciate what he's actually doing here. Yeah, I didn't I didn't join the Rooftop Society, so I don't have access to all those annotations. Yeah. On the language and the line level, yeah, like dude dude's got it. He's he's the goods. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, most of it is just over my head because I'm I'm one of those I like things that don't have melody, apparently. I want yeah. Give me Lady Gaga. Enough of this Judy Garland. Give me some Lady Gaga. So up next, we'll have JR, <laughs> which is absolutely symphonic. In okay. terms of voice, it's all voices. It's all voices, very little description, very much like set up in scenes in like a uh, picaresque sort of way, or like mm -hmm. an episodic, sorry, episodic sort of way is what I mean. So it, I think it's going to be really fun to read during the pandemic times because it doesn't have like it's one sustained thing, but it's very much like a quick hitting, funny, short bit. I was hoping we do the Fountainhead, but okay. Yeah, I know the Fountainhead is really where it's at because like I'm very concerned about individualism and individuality and objective and objectivism in 2021 going forward. If like, the so fake election. Get your mask on, cough on people. Fuck you. Masks don't work. Things gotta breathe, baby. Sorry. Okay, don't say that. I want to make it very clear on this podcast that I believe in masks and COVID. <laughs> so, anyways, I will be putting the 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 reading schedule up for JR tomorrow. Awesome. Um, and we'll email a bunch of people that I would like to invite on the show. But if you would like to come on the show and talk to us, I think the JR season needs like endless guests. We just, we just took on Ada or Arter by ourselves, basically. And that's hard. <laughs> we need your help. Yeah, we're not good at books. So if we get people that know about books and are good at them, that'd be fantastic. If you've already read it. I've read it, but like it's been literally 25 years. So yeah, I'm going in blind. So. It's yeah. I remember one specific thing about Jr. is that one of the characters is always pulling shit out of his coat and out of his pockets. He has like paper and coins and keys and shit. It's just like shit in his pockets. And my ex-wife used to say that that was me because I would just like have my jacket walk in and just pull out shit and put it on a on a counter. You like I relate to that. In your pocket, boom. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I was, like, I was like, you know what I have in my pocket? Your fucking wedding ring, bitch! <laughs> and that was the last time I saw her. That's cinematic. That's really cinematic, Chad. Jeez. Very cinematic. Yeah, that seems like a fake pass to me. Yeah, I didn't actually do that. Well, scholarship. Let's actually be, uh, let's try to be smart next week. That sounds fun. So I have two things right now, and I'll find a third one. So we'll have three things to go over. Let's I have to send one in for you, but uh, but I have this. I have this under control. So cool. we'll, we'll know that we'll talk next Wednesday and we will go over the scholarship for Ada or Arter, probably half of which will explain how you pronounce their names. Um, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> <laughs>